I'm Alan Shipton, the author of On Jazz. I'm a research fellow in jazz at the Royal Academy of Music, but my background in the music of jazz goes back a lot further than that because I've been a musician since the 1970s. I've worked with all sorts of musicians in jazz on books about the music. I've written one of the standard histories, which is called A New History of Jazz, now through two editions. And I've also uh, helped get out into print the autobiographies of a huge number of significant musicians, some of which I've edited myself. So people like Sir George Shearing and uh, the great New Orleans guitarist Danny Barker, the wonderful trumpeter Doc Cheatham. All these books have come out as a result of my passionate interest in the music. On Jazz is a funny mixture of my personal journey of discovery through the music and a sort of potted history of bits of it at the same time. It starts as my own discovery of the music does with the very earliest days of jazz. So I begin in New Orleans with the traditional jazz sounds. I move through the swing era and then into the beginning of modern jazz with bebop, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, the dawn of the modern jazz quartet. And from there we move on to that wonderful saxophonist Sonny Rollins, who's shared so much of his life with me. And it was a privilege to be able to put a big interview with him into the book. But also it comes right up to date. So via Miles Davis and fusion, it brings us through to the music of young musicians like Theo Croker, who I admire tremendously as a young American musician who's bringing in hip hop and other uh, new kinds of sounds to jazz, but who's also very astutely aware of the tradition because he is Doc Cheatham's grandson. One of the advantages of having worked not just as a researcher for books, but also as a broadcaster for a very long time, I'm celebrating over 30 years working for BBC Radio 3, is that I've had the opportunity to travel around the world and meet and interview many, many people in jazz. And this is something which the big problem with a broadcast is it's ephemeral. You make the broadcast, it goes out and it's largely gone. Some of mine have been preserved as podcasts, but that's not really a way of keeping a permanent record of some of the really extraordinarily illuminating things people have said over the years. So what I wanted to do with this book was to go back through the practically 1000 interviews that I've got sitting under my stairs and try and draw from those something that illuminated both the things that I found out as I was trying to learn more about this music and also the things that different people have told me that's made a very personal difference to how I hear their music and the music in general. And one glorious thing about this opportunity is that I've been able to put different people's points of view together so that you can learn about certain stages in the music from more than one particular viewpoint. So for example, in the Oscar Peterson chapter, we also have input from his long-term bassist, Ray Brown, his second long-term bassist, Neil Henning Oster Pedersen, and his drummer, Ed Thigpen. So their voices occupy just as central a place as Oscar Peterson's own. And I should just say that one of the marvellous things about being a publisher in this music for so long is that I was actually able to publish Oscar's autobiography. So we knew each other pretty well. I did liner notes for many of his albums. And so, again, there's a slightly insider view of his music. And that carried through through having met many of his colleagues at live sessions with him over the years. There are plenty of memoirs about jazz, and for the most part, they tend to be one person's story. So this book differs in the fact that it is a kaleidoscope of lots of different people's story about the music. And what I wanted to do was to show that you can learn a lot, both from documentary evidence. So in some cases I look at newspapers, I look at magazines, I look at people's accounts in books about jazz, but they don't stand as the only viewpoint right the way through the book. So that's the first point, which is that I think you can learn a huge amount about how music has developed, how music has developed, not just in North America, but internationally by sharing different viewpoints. But the other really significant thing is to take some of the canards, some of the things that we all thought we knew about jazz and to look at them afresh. And I suppose what might become the most controversial chapter is the one about Duke Ellington. Now, not 
just his producer, George Avakian, but many people in print have said that the Ellington Band was in a terminal decline in the early 1950s, and suddenly they appeared at the Newport Festival in 1956. Paul Gonzalez played a staggering solo on Diminuendo and Crescendo in Blue, and the band was reborn. Well, I love the music from Newport, and my own band, the Buck Clayton Legacy Band, has played transcriptions of the Newport Suite that was premiered there. But I wanted to get inside it, and I also wanted to see if the band had actually been in decline for the years before. Not a bit of it. Some of the key musicians left in 1952, but the people who came in were fantastic. And so I have personal accounts from the drummer Louis Belson, from the bassist Jimmy Woody, who joined a year and a half before Newport, and also from uh, a number of people who were involved in the production of the Newport uh, recordings. So you have again a chance to see the band from inside. And I should say that Jimmy Woody, the bassist in the band, became a great friend of mine. I invited him to a symposium in Switzerland several years ago about Ellington's music, and he played with the Swiss Romand big band, recreating some of the Ellington charts. And then he stayed on for a week and taught me a lot about bass playing. When we did the Newport Suite in Switzerland, uh, I was uh, playing in Thalville near Zurich, and because the bass they'd found for me wasn't quite the right one, the sound engineer took me to a house where he knew there was an instrument that would work and it was Jimmy Woody's bass. So I actually played that music on his own instrument, which was a very poignant moment for me. But I hope that people coming to that chapter will realize that I'm talking about this from the points of view of musicians who were there and that I've looked very seriously at what the band was doing before and after that so-called Renaissance of 1956. My own favorite jazz musicians come in two categories, really. There are the people I've discovered through records, and that started when I was a kid, listening to people like Fats Waller, Muggsy Spanier, Earl Hines, Duke Ellington, because my dad's record collection was a wonderful place to go out and discover about music. They played those music, they played that music to me when I was very young. And then I started my own collection when I was at primary school. So I've been very involved in listening to music on record. So all those names I've mentioned and many more that I've discovered through records. So I never had the chance, for example, to hear Errol Garner live, but I have a fantastic collection of his music. I love his piano playing. Um, I love the fact that George Shearing, when I was working with him on his book, said, well, Errol Garner, we all called him the scraper. And I said, why is that, George? He said, just listen to that left hand. He sort of scrapes it over the keyboard. And that's the secret of his timing. Nobody else has got that secret. So it was wonderful to have George's perspective on somebody he'd heard live and to listen to those, uh, those records afresh. So the recording collection has a lot of people I really admire. Um, there's masses of Oscar Peterson, there's masses of Miles Davis, there's masses of John Coltrane, there's masses of Ornette, Col Ornette Coleman. So these are all musicians that I've learned to love through their records. Miles Davis, I think, is a particular case in point because I never got to hear him live uh, he was playing at a festival in London and I had the chance to go up and hear one concert and I thought well who's the oldest musician I'd better go for that first I went to hear Art Blakey instead which was great a fantastic concert so I went to hear Art and never got to hear Miles playing live so that's the first category but the second is the people who've been mentors to me over the years and I mentioned two of them in the book The New Orleans guitarist Danny Barker was somebody that I met in the 70s and we remained friends to the end of his life. We did two books together, but Danny was more than a co-author. He was my guide to the music of New Orleans. He used to put me in his decrepit old car and drive me around and say, that's where Sidney Bechet was born. That's the dance hall where King Oliver used to play. And there's no substitute for having that kind of personal guide to the early days of the music. So it was through Danny Barker that I met Buck Clayton, and sometimes it just happens that you meet somebody who's on the same wavelength, and it was like that with me and Buck. I ended up publishing his book, uh, his life story. I told him that I didn't think it was finished, because it ended with him in hospital with a severe illness, and it sort of finished as he came out of the intensive care unit to look forward to a life. But in the time that he had spent between coming out of hospital and our meeting, 
he'd formed a band in New York to play new music that he was writing and he was directing the band. So I said, you've got to write more of this book. And in that process, working together on finishing the book, we became good friends. I was splitting my time working between London and New York at that time. So every time I went to New York, we got together, not to work on the book, but just to be chums, to meet up. Often we just met in his favorite bar, which overlooked the street outside Grand Central Station at the Hyatt Hotel there. He liked to have a seat right by the plate glass window and we'd, we'd swap stories about, what do you think that guy over there is doing? What are these people up to? And Buck always had wonderful stories. And he introduced me to lots of the traditions of the Count Basie band where they'd have just that kind of conversation about people in the audience at a club. Somebody would lean over during somebody else's sermon and say, hey, see those people at table three, where do you think they're from? What are they doing? And we shared that, but he also took me to hear music. So during that time in New York, I was able to meet many of his friends and counterparts from the Basie era and beyond. And we just went to concerts. We used to love going and hanging out together, listening to music. And that, his guidance to the New York scene at that time was priceless. When Buck died, he left me his music. And so I had a band, I found, formed a band at the beginning of this century to keep his musical tradition alive. And we've been playing that now since 2004. And it's wonderful to feel that as my debt of gratitude to him, we're able to keep that music alive. So that's one of my great musical friends and, and my colleagues over the years. I suppose if you started listening to a particular kind of music very young, then it goes in with the milk. And in my case, jazz was there from the start, but so was classical music. And uh, my father had a great collection of classical records. I remember hearing Walter Gisa King and Ben Mazevich and other great pianists. I had Pablo Casals when I was very young on record. And this meant that my education in music was a twin track. I was listening to classical music. I was very fortunate as a boy to be able to hear people like Paul Tertillier, Marisa Robles, Fu Chong, John Ogden, wonderful figures in the classical world. But I was also listening to jazz from an early age. And as a teenager, I was playing both. And I'm sure this is mistaken now because I've had lots of fun over the years playing classical music since, but I thought the jazz musicians were more fun. I thought the music was more fun. So I ended up just wanting to play jazz and the opportunities were there for me to do that as a schoolboy and later as a student. So I was playing in London and living first in Surrey and then in Oxford uh, uh, as a schoolboy and a student. And this natural musical life just took, a, uh, took on a, a direction of its own. So I'd fallen in love with the music as a child. I was able to start playing it as a teenager and I've been doing both ever since, listening to it as an addict and, and playing it as much as I can and not restricting myself to one style because as I say in the book, I did have a moment when I was playing quite avant-garde material with people like Mike Westbrook and Noel Coxhill at the same time as playing New Orleans music with some of the founding fathers and uh, some of the founding sisters too of the music in its early days. And that's another thing I should mention about the book in that I think the story of women in jazz right the way through is missing from many jazz histories. And I've tried, and it's not tokenism, I've tried to show that women had a very vital part to play right the way through the development of this music. So I'm very proud that one big interview I did with Johnny Barker's wife, Blue Lou, who was a big recording star on Decca and Capitol in the 30s and 40s. This is the first real attempt to tell her story in print for the first time. I looked at another New Orleans musician, well, she's based there, she's from Kentwood, Louisiana, but Topsy Chapman, who's a great singer and toured with the New Orleans show one more time, came here and that's when I met her first in London, singing here and then we caught up with each other many times in New Orleans. But Topsy's story again is about that transition from gospel music to jazz. She was a gospel singer. She was discovered singing at the Jazz Festival in New Orleans. And I remember going to the gospel tent there in the 70s and being blown away by this music. So there's her story. And as we go through, there are more stories. So I have a lovely interview with Jewel Brown, who was the singer with Louis Armstrong's All Stars. I talked to people who sang with Count Basie. Um, there's a tiny snippet in the book with Tony Bennett, who I was lucky enough to meet on a festival here in Britain and chatted to him about his music. And um, it's very sad that Tony's now no longer singing, but he's still with us. And there he is popping up in the book alongside um, uh, Carmen Bradford, who sang with the Basie Band. And she tells me her amazing story about how she was 
she had the chutzpah to go up to Basie and say, I think I need to be the singer with your band. You'll make billions of dollars if I sing with you. And it's just a great story. Then we come right up to date with the late Jerry Allen, who was the pianist with Ornette Coleman. And I, I was very fond of Jerry. We met many times over the years. And she was brave enough to do a live broadcast in front of an audience with me at the London Jazz Festival in 2010. And bits of that interview too are in the book because this is Jerry not just talking to me, but sharing her musical life at two levels on the page in the book, but also with the public at that event at the South Bank in London. It's a difficult question when you've written a book to try and work out exactly who it's for because every book changes as you write it but I had a particular audience in mind for this book for the last 10 years I've been presenting jazz record requests on BBC Radio 3 and every week's an education the, the reason I say that is that I think I know quite a bit about jazz but every week I get a letter from some listener who introduces me to something I've never heard before and that education and that joy of discovery is something I wanted to share with readers. And I feel it's that community. Many people write to the programme saying, I don't know anything about jazz, but particularly during lockdown, I started listening to the programme on BBC Sounds or, or live, and I've discovered loads about it. So how can I find out more? So at the very basic level, this book is for people who want to find out more and who want not just my guidance, but the guidance of the people who made jazz during its life of the last 120 odd years. So that's the first thing. Secondly, I'm sure it will have a market uh, for people who study jazz. I've taught for some 15 years now at the Royal Academy of Music, and I know that there are things in this book that will be valuable for my undergraduates as they go forward and, and discover more about jazz themselves. So it has an academic market, it has a general market, and I think generally it's for people who think they like a bit about jazz but want to know more and I hope that if they come at it from one angle like they've discovered Miles Davis well there's a chapter that talks about that but they might want to work backwards to the earlier days or they might want to work forwards into other areas of fusion there's lots with John McLaughlin about Mahavishnu there's discussion with Billy Cobham about that period so there's a chance to to move in both directions from whatever your point of entry is. One of the great myths about jazz in the 1940s was that there was a schism between the people who were developing modern jazz and the people who played the more traditional or mainstream types of the music. And it got to the point where two critics in particular, Barry Ulanoff in the States and Leonard Feather, divided listeners into people who they thought were hip to jazz and what they called moldy figs, who were basically the people who listened to traditional or mainstream jazz. And that schism has persisted in jazz criticism and almost every history of jazz that you read will say that in the 1940s, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk, Bud Powell, a group of, of modernists moved jazz on from the music of the Moldy Figs. Well, my 1940s chapter in this book, which includes interviews with many participants in Dizzy's band, people who work with Charlie Parker, is about the fact that it was a very much more fluid scene than that. Musicians moved easily from one style to another. There's a long interview with a man who became a dear friend, Sir Charles Thompson, the pianist, who played with Buck Clayton, and that's one reason I got to know him. But Sir Charles became known in the 50s and 60s as a brilliant mainstream pianist playing the older styles of jazz. But in the 1940s, he was playing bebop on 52nd Street with Charlie Parker. And Jimmy Woody, also mainly known as the Ellington bassist, was also playing with Charlie Parker at that time. Indeed, at one point, they're in the same band and there are records which I discuss in the book of the two of them together playing with Parker. And Stan Levy, very much thought of as the bebop drummer who went to the West Coast with Dizzy Gillespie in 1945 and played bebop with him and Charlie Parker, made his first records with Art Tatum and Barney Bigard. So there's this false idea that jazz was divided into these different camps in the 1940s. And I think one of the things that I set out to do here is to show that it's far more fluid than that. And that if you could play, if you had the ears to hear this music and the chops to play it, then you could float from one genre to another quite easily. And that that feeling of artificial boundaries is something that I think has been erected by critics and writers since, because it suits the idea of writing. It's a great story but it's not necessarily the whole truth. <laughs> 
I thought very hard about this and I thought I'd do a top 10 of my favorite records. And I'm gonna hold one up now. This is a collection of the music of Billie Holiday and Lester Young. And that's not just because she's the singer that's, I even get emotional talking about Billie Holiday. She, she really does touch my heartstrings and Lester's playing is the same. There's a lot about him in the book. But the reason I love this is that in this set of CDs, you can hear all my friends. You can hear Buck Clayton, Doc Cheatham, Al Casey, the guitarist with whom I toured, who worked with Fat Swallow, Danny Barker, Harry Sweets Edison, who played with the Basie Band, and Mal Waldron, the pianist, and he's another case of somebody who crosses boundaries. Mal was Billy's accompanist, but he also worked with John Coltrane. And you can't get more different than that. So that set for me is not just about great music. It's about my personal friends and people that have meant a lot to me. So that's my top of the top 10. Next, because it had to be there, is something by Miles Davis. And I agonized about this. But again, the record I've chosen, Bitches, Bitches Brew, is one that has so many people who appear in this book. So John McLaughlin, Dave Holland. It, it's, a, it's a long list of people who work with Miles. And I feel that this record, which is the beginning of fusion too, so it's another story, it influenced so many people. That's an important one. And my previous book was called The Art of Jazz. There's so much to say about the artwork of the cover by Matty Clavine of the art uh, of Bitches Brew. It's just a great piece of visual art as well as oral art. So what next? Well, Jerry Allen and Ornette Coleman. Ornette was a hero of mine and there's a big chapter about him in the book. I've tried to proselytize for Ornette because a lot of people who look at the history of jazz say, well, there are these great names, Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, and possibly Ornette. And in my view, Ornette is one of the greats. He's up there with those others. So the chapter is about that. And I was trying to find something that showed that beautiful connection between him and Jerry Allen. So there's two CDs called Sound Museum that have them together. And also the wonderful Charlie Hayden on bass is there as well. And Charlie's somebody I, I talk to many times over the years. Then I had to have something with Oscar Peterson and it has to be Ella and Louis. Ella Fitzgerald, Louis Armstrong, apart from uh, Billie Holiday, my two other favorite vocalists, and of course, Louis, the greatest trumpeter in jazz history. So uh, there, Ella and Louis, volume two, which has my chum Louis Belson on drums, Ray Brown, Oscar Peterson, and Herb Ellis on guitar. It's just a great album. And if you've never heard jazz before, that's a really good starting point. I played one of the tracks on my radio program for somebody as a request just a few weeks ago, and I had lots of letters in from people saying, I've never heard that before, it's just wonderful. So I think that is one of those records that can bring people to jazz. Ellington at Newport has to be there. It's a controversial record in the book, but it's great. And of course, it's got the wonderful Jimmy Woody and the wonderful Clark Terry playing in the band at that time. The Atomic Mr. Basie, wonderful arrangements by Neil Hefty. And again, there's plenty about how those arrangements work with the band in the book. And I talked to the trombonist Benny Powell and Al Gray and other musicians who'd worked with bass. There's a nice interview with Buddy Tate, which I did on his 80th birthday. Went to his house in Long Island and uh, had a great day just reminiscing about the music. I'd met him before in London and in New York, but it was wonderful to hear about the early days of Basie. But I think the Atomic Basie stands for me as one of the great albums of the 1950s. Now, this is a, a funny one, Abby Lincoln. Abby Lincoln was a great vocalist. I remember hear, hearing her at the Queen Elizabeth Hall in London during one of the London jazz festivals and being moved to tears by her singing. I've chosen an album called Straight Ahead because it's again, one of these records that shows that there were no boundaries in jazz. So it has her husband at the time, Max Roach playing drums and it has Coleman Hawkins appearing on it. So it's a wonderful amalgam of the jazz scene of New York, just at the turn of the fifties to the sixties. Sonny Rollins has to be there. Sonny's been so kind to me over the years and uh, he's been an inspiration at every concert where I've ever heard him on both sides of the Atlantic. He's just, a, well, they used to say at the London Jazz Festival, the world's greatest living saxophonist. And I think that's probably true. So I've chosen the Freedom Suite and for reasons that will become clear when you read the book, because we discovered a mutual love for the bassist on that, Oscar Pettiford. I never got to hear Oscar live. Sonny was lucky enough to meet him and record with him on that record. So Sonny Rollins' Freedom Suite. Then the wackiest choice, Carla Blaze, Escalator Over the Hill. 
This is a sprawling jazz opera, sort of. Uh, it has lots of different voices in it. it. The story is extremely difficult to fathom, but I love it because Carla's uh, somebody, again, I look up to. I've enjoyed her music for many, many years. I think she's one of the greatest of jazz composers and writers. She's a great band leader. She's a fine pianist, though she always says that she's just a band pianist, but that's not true. She's a wonderful pianist. Escalator Over the Hill has all that, and it has many of the musicians we've mentioned, but in particular, it has somebody I admire from a different genre of music who, well, started in jazz and finished in jazz, Jack Bruce. And he is the Jack who sings in Escalator Over the Hill. So I love the idea that the rock and the jazz generations come together in this sprawling work. And again, I suppose it's about crossing boundaries, just like I don't think there are boundaries in jazz. There aren't very many in Escalator Over the Hill. And finally, the musician who I mentioned earlier in this interview, Theo Croker. Um, I love Theo's trumpet playing. He's still going, he's got a new album out around the time that the book comes out. But the previous one, Star People Nation, is an absolutely wonderful amalgam of something that looks back at the tradition, his playing on trumpet. Well, you can tell that his grandfather was one of the great trumpeters and brought him up to hear many of them. But he studied with Donald Byrd and he's got a really encyclopedic knowledge of the trumpet tradition, but he's also somebody who's working with DJs, MCs, and bringing in new blood to jazz, but without any disrespect for the tradition. So Star People Nation's my final top 10 choice. As a final thing, after my top 10 records, I might just say that there's another aspect to this book that's a bit different from any other book that I've ever done, which is there is an audio book to go with it. So uh, you'll have to put up with my voice reading most of it, but you'll also hear the voices of many of the people I've talked about, because wherever possible, I've been able to use the original interviews that I did with the participants. So the audiobook is a kaleidoscope of voices for music that is in itself kaleidoscopic. <laughs> 